On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Alan Malventano drops by to show Intel's brand new storage system that is unbelievably fast. Then F5 drops in to tell you about the FBI, honeypots, and deceptive defensive practices. Twyat on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyat. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 236. Recorded April 21st, 2017. Crosspoint, honeypots, and deceptive solutions. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobostore.com to learn more and use the code TWIT10 to save 10% off select Drobos, including the new Drobo 5N2. And literally by Sonic, TWIT's 10-gig fiber internet service provider. Join Sonic's internet revolution as they bring fast, affordable internet phone and TV to homes and businesses all over California. Visit sonic.com slash twit to sign up for service and receive your first month free. And by GoCD, an on-premise open source continuous delivery server by ThoughtWorks. GoCD gives you complete control of and visibility into your deployments across multiple teams. Since GoCD is open source, you can download and use it for free. To discover the power of their pipelines, visit gocd.io slash twit. Welcome to Twyat. This week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise, but I cannot guide you by myself. It's an awful big world. I'm going to need a little help from my friends, starting with Mr. Lou Maresca. He's a senior lead developer at Microsoft. Now, Lou, there's this vicious rumor that it's actually sunny right now. Is, is I wouldn't call it vicious. It's actually a day where I can have a little bit of energy and get things done since we're preparing for build next month. So That's right. That's yeah. right. Oh, which, by the way, just, just FYI, I did reach out to my build contact, and they said that you don't have to go as me. If you'd like, they can change my registration to your name. So if you want to rep Twyat, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. All right. All right. Uh, and also joining us is my good friend, Mr. Brian Chi. He's a director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. He is the geek in paradise Gbert, I, 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 is our weather better than yours right now? <laughs> yeah, we um, we have a fairly large rain band going over the islands, and uh, we also have some high surf warnings, so that's kind of fun. Yeah, well. and uh, big, big. By the way, big thank you to the folks at Boomerang, so that I can actually send out delayed email to send out show reminders. Big apologies to Lou about. <laughs> screwing up the schedule. Hey, you know what? This Twilight is kind of like performance art. So this this is what we get. Well, gentlemen, the die is cast. This is going to be at one heck of an episode because we've got not one guest, but two. Now, this is normally the time when we start off with the blips, but we're going to push that back because this news cannot be contained any longer. We've got the one, the only, the incomparable Alan Malventano from PC Perspective. Alan, thank you very much for coming back on to This Week in Enterprise Tech. Thanks for having me. Now, we're not just having you here because you're another pretty face. We've got you here because you have had the, I'm not going to say one of the, but the first real in-depth look at a technology that so many of us have been waiting for for the longest time. Of course, I'm speaking about Intel's crazy fast cross-point technology. You may remember back in 2015, July, I believe, Intel and Micron announced that they had created a new technology that they called 3D Crosspoint. Now, the whole idea was to have a non-volatile memory that kind of blurred the boundaries between system memory and system storage. Uh, the Crosspoint array structure, and Kara, you've got a you've got a, a picture here that you can uh, you can use. Looks like a grid of parallel wires that are perpendicular to one another. They they connect columns that are individual memory cells. Uh, you can address any single cell by using the two wires that connect the top and the bottom of that column. You can also stack these columns on top of each other, creating a 3D grid of memory cells, also making a very dense memory structure. It's transistor-less addressing. It's crazy fast because of the lack of transistors, because the, tr the cross-point array structure allows each cell to be addressed more quickly. 
And they said way back then that it was going to be up to a thousand times faster than a traditional NAND cell. It also lasted a lot longer. It didn't run out its cell like the traditional flash did. And this got people thinking that this was going to change literally the PC industry because it was going to change a very long held belief that you needed system memory, then you needed system storage. Alan, that was the promise in a nutshell. And it got very exciting and people really wanted to get their hands on this, but this was almost two years ago. And uh, mm -hmm. well, we finally got our hands on something. Tell me a little bit about what you found with Intel's brand spanking new product. Yeah, so uh, before we get into actual results, I'm going to flip around kind of walking through uh, the review and kind of skip right to a comparison I had to kind of put out there to, to for for helping people wrap their heads around this, right? Because, you know, when people start saying things like, oh, a thousand times faster, or right. in this case, once it's actually implemented in this form, only works out to about 10 times faster than a pretty fast, like, competing NAND product. Um, however, 10 times faster is still a big deal. Uh, like when you reduce latency to one tenth of what it was before, uh, things, you know, things are a lot different. And so to kind of put that in perspective, I prepared a series of charts in the review, uh, just you know, like a series called bridging the gap. And I was kind of showing people what, what the pain used to be, um, for, you know, so there's, there's your, this is the slide that Intel provided, which is, you know, showing cross point in the middle and they're just, they gave you a bunch of numbers there, 10 times this, 100 times that, 1,000 times that, comparing where it sits between, you know, the cache on your CPU going all the way out to a hard drive on one end of the spectrum and the other. And Crosspoint sits between DRAM speeds and NAND, like your typical SSD speeds. Um, but if you scroll down a little bit, you can, uh, you can see what the gap used to look like between DRAM and a hard drive. So the things on the right side of that chart there are your various you know, 10,000, 7,200, 5,400 RPM hard drives. And then I even spiced it up and added a zip drive, a CD-ROM, and a floppy. So there is actually a floppy drive performance curve at the <laughs> far right of that chart. Wow. So that's a, that's a logarithmic scale chart, which enables me to do some really cool stuff like have a floppy at one end and have one clock cycle of a 4 gigahertz CPU at the other on the same chart, right? Um, so basically, you're going from the pretty much the slowest possible thing you know, uh, to the fastest possible thing, right? You know, your computer can do one calculation in like one cycle, and there it is, you know, at the other end of the spectrum. Well, there used to be this huge gap in the middle, right? Between the DRAM there and like, say, even if you had a Velociraptor, which is what that, you know, closest to it, closest to the DRAM speed thing is, there is a 100,000 times latency gap. <laughs> so every time your computer ran out of, uh, things cached in the RAM and had to go and ask the disk for something, you had to wait. You know, the computer itself basically just had to wait 100,000 100, times the latency, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, so that chart also gives you a good perspective of what it felt like to go move from floppy to hard disks, right? Obviously, that was a big jump, uh, trying to run something from a floppy disk to when it was on a hard disk, right? So you can get a, kind of get a feel for the scope of that on that chart, you know, moves over a couple of major divisions there that's a that's a hundred times gain uh you know in your in your relative uh speed so if you go down on the next chart i introduced solid state drives which everybody that's used to use hard disks and moved to solid state drives will remember that was like a night and day difference right it was pretty amazing when you when people put their first ssd in a computer and tried to boot off of it and was like holy crap look at how much faster this is well the early days of that is actually that dashed gray line to the right there uh, which isn't that much faster than the hard drive, but it was around 10 times a reduction in the latency. Um, and then uh, as SATA SSDs and NAND technology evolved and got faster and faster, uh, that boundary got pushed even further to the point where a SATA uh, solid state drive today is running around 100 times quicker latency than you know a modern hard disk drive. And Alan, then, uh, let, let me break in here because I, I'm so happy that you are talking in terms of latency right now because we have this tendency yeah. when we when we try to break down specs, it's all about speed. It's all about throughput. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, that kind of comparison is falling apart now that we're actually hit, actively hitting the, the, the top of, uh, of our bus. You, you can't just think in terms of, of raw transfer rate, especially since this is an enterprise product. You have to look at things like latency and saturation. Exactly. Latency. Can you, exactly. you? You are one of the only ones to actually test this in, in, a, in a quantifiable way. Can you tell us 
why latency and saturated latency is important to us. Well, uh, so here's the thing. Uh, latency, in this case, I'm not fully saturating these products. And for example, on this chart, I'm only doing Q-depth 1, right, um, right. which is actually something important to note is that Q-depth 1 performance, even for enterprise, like people tend to go, oh, you know, an, enter an enterprise server is never just going to do one thing at a time. It's always doing lots of things at a time. Well, here's the catch. Let's say that those NAND SSDs there, let's say that one of those was like an enterprise NAND part. And granted, it is going 100 times faster than a hard disk would run, uh, you know, for, for each lookup it had to do in an enterprise scenario, right? Which is definitely amazing, right? Um, if you scroll down to the next chart, you'll see a thing that's like, wouldn't it be nice if you were able to <laughs> drop that by another one-tenth yeah, of the latency, okay. I'll do that. right? Uh, and again, before we go too complicated on this, imagine if you had a, a, a workload that was running on the NAND SSD, so like say that you know brown line there on the chart or the gray line, uh, say that workload was running at a Q depth of 10, right? If you had that same exact, in other words, meaning 10 requests at the same time right. were kind of piled up on the SSD, right? If you had that same identical workload running on this, on this newest product, product, which is the blue line on that chart, which is again, kind of closing this gap even closer between the DRAM speed and the NAND flash speed, uh, that same workload would only run at a Q depth of one because this product is servicing every request in one tenth of the, the, the amount of time, right? So basically, it's able to chew through these requests so quickly that they don't even get a chance to stack up, um, which, is, which is significant, right? right. That's, and, and pretty amazing too, like the kinds of differences you can get as you reduce, you know, as you reduce the latency uh, of this device. Now, now, kind of circling back to the whole saturated and, and, and whatnot, are, are you referring to, like, in terms of high Q depth or just yeah. uh, where were you going with that? No, because, it's um, Q depth because, because, you know, there, it's important. Uh, people think of Crosspoint and they think, oh, this is going to be my next SSD. Well, right now, uh, let's get this out of the way. Right now, there is a sticker shock. What's How, oh, how, how big is the device that you tested? Uh, 375 gig. And what was the price on that 375 gig drive? Fifteen hundred and twenty dollars. Okay, so yeah, this there's a little bit of a premium. So this is not a consumer product. In fact, they tell you this is an enterprise product. But this is Correct. what matters. This is why you you can't just take a consumer SSD that is quote unquote fast and drop it into an enterprise cent, uh, data center and expect uh -huh. it to to give you optimal performance because it may be fast, but if it doesn't deal with the queue really really well, if it doesn't have low latency, then you're just going to stack up requests for days and days and days. This exactly. this product is specifically designed to eliminate that, right? Yes, yes. It's 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 meant to just be as fast as it can possibly be. To the point where I ran into many challenges in even testing this product because uh, the Windows kernel or even right. the Linux kernel or just all these uh, like the mere method that you used to do a I/O request. You want a piece of information from a storage thing on a computer, right? What typically happens. And remember, these routines were kind of carried all the way back from the hard disk days uh, where it was, why would you request something from a disk and then just wait on it and not allow the CPU to do anything else? That would be silly. So what actually happens in modern computers is the request goes out there. It's understood that it's going to take a while. So it actually, uh, basically, the, the, the request for completion goes out there, but it goes out there with like a time delay. And... If it's not ready right away, and of course it's not if you were asking a hard drive for a piece of information or even an SSD in this case because we're running at CPU speed here. Um, if it's not ready immediately, then what, what happens is you end up with what's called an interrupt request gets set up. And the storage device has what's called also called DMA, which is direct memory access. And so people might remember DMA from the hard disk days when you went from PIO mode to DMA mode, which sped things up. The reason it sped things up is the computer, the CPU, could go off, do some other stuff. The hard disk, when it had re finished retrieving its data, that data would go straight into RAM, hence the direct memory access, right? And then once that process was complete, it would let the CPU know by means of what's called an interrupt, which basically interrupts the CPU from the other thing that it was doing. It could have been like updating where the mouse was on the screen or whatever else it was doing, right? It would go back and go, kind of get its attention and go, all right, my information is is back here. Now I can, 
you know, I can do what, what I was supposed to be doing with it and find the program that was using that, you know, that requested that piece of information and go back to that program and, you know, give that some, some of my time. Um, that whole process I just described, that takes a few microseconds. Um, this thing responds in 10 microseconds. <laughs> So it's becoming significant, right? If you had a NAND product that responded in 100 microseconds, right. ah, what's another couple of microseconds each time you request something? But now you're you're getting a significant percentage of the amount of time you're waiting. So, or, you know, the amount of time that you're tacking on to each wait uh, for this device. So we actually had to test this device in like, I had to sort of approximate what the method would be with an, what, would, what would have to eventually evolve to kernel improvements and optimized drivers and other things. Because as it stands right now, we tested an NVMe storage device. You know, this 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 device speaks NVMe just like any other NAND SSD does right now. Um, uh, but we were you still we were using like the Microsoft Inbox driver, so default driver, nothing special, and just speaking standard NVMe commands. And so this is basically something that's running much closer to RAM speed, but has to go jump through all of these hoops, OS wise and device wise and how it speaks over uh pcie it has to kind of like go out of its way to be backwards compatible uh you know and and speak the old language and do the things in the old manner um and yet still be 10 times faster than the, than the next fastest thing out right so yeah and, and this is, being, that's one of those things that we we actually pointed out back when this technology was first introduced and that is it's it the, the architecture that we use has to change the architecture that we used assumed two discrete subsystems for storage and for memory. This is really blurring the lines, and now it's it, you know it's it's not going to just be a new technology, a new drive that you drop into your computer. It's an entirely new architecture. It's an entirely new motherboard. It's an entirely new operating system, and especially on the enterprise side, which will want to take advantage of the speed. It means that you're going to have to replumb your data centers and the way that you serve out data because this is not just fast. It's phenomenally fast. Right, right. And um, not only that, but it does offer even additional benefits when you get to uh, what you were referring to as a saturated I.O., even when you do start stacking requests higher and higher. On a NAND SSD, and if you wanted to, say, rewrite or change the contents of a single byte of information, right? Say the drive is full. You want to change one byte. Uh, the way NAND flash works is you can write it in pages, which are several kilobytes in size, but then you can only erase it in blocks, which are a megabyte or larger in size. So you have to play musical chairs, right? Each one of these blocks works sort of like an older CDRW used to work back in the day. If you had a full CDRW that was written front to back and you wanted to change the contents of one file, the only way to do it was to read the whole thing, erase the whole disk, and then rewrite the whole disk with the updated contents changed. Right, right. That's what NAND SSDs have to do in the background every time you change a few kilobytes of data on the disk every time you update a few kilobytes of data. Crosspoint, none of this applies. So not only is there not pages and blocks and you don't have to do any of this musical chair stuff uh, because you can address it at the byte or even bit level depending on how it's you know connected and implemented and whatnot. Um, there's not even an erase procedure. When you want to overwrite something, you literally just address the spot you want to overwrite. You don't care what was there before. Whatever the process is to a complete a write on a cell that has never been written is the same as one that is uh, is to a cell that has already has some other contents. It doesn't matter. So you just overwrite in place, right? So that's all of that. That's the kind of stuff that adds up to this thousand times improvement over NAND, right? You're not right. trying to shuffle stuff around. You're not having to jump through all these hoops. Yeah, you're uh, the controller have a design on every cell that's going to slow you down every time you want to do an addressing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so all these other benefits, right? So now. Getting into the actual thing, right, and how it responds when you put enterprise-level workloads and even uh, up to saturation workloads on it, uh, that would be on, like, the 4K random page. I think that's the third page we were going to talk about. Um, if you look at the first chart there, what that first contents of the first chart is on the left edge is random writes. On the right edge is random reads. And then you have the, the reason there are lines is I'm just showing everything in between. If you were doing 50-50, just look down the middle for reads and writes. Um, each line represents a progressively higher Q depth. Okay, uh, So you got the blue line, orange line, gray, and then yellow. And then there's a whole blob of lines on top of that. 
Um, so here's the key here. This SSD is saturated doing 550 plus thousand IOPS requests per second. Uh, and it reaches that level actually at Q depth of 12, which is which is probably halfway between the yellow line and what would be the next line. All that blob of lines to the top of that chart where it is actually queued up 16, 32, 64. Like it doesn't matter how much further you go. This drive is, is saturated very early, right? Um, and that's key if you try to compare it to any enterprise products, if you go down, any other uh, enterprise NAND products, if you go down on the next chart. So I've isolated the first three rungs of that ladder from the previous chart, and now they're blue, <laughs> okay? And I've included the first three rungs that would be queued up one, two, and four of a Micron 9100 Max, which is the fastest NVMe SSD we've tested to date on the market, uh, and that's in gold on that chart. And then I've also included Intel's uh, P3700 SSD, and that's in green on that chart. And you'll notice Q depth of one on this new Optane SSD is higher in almost all cases than Q depth of four on all of these competing NAND products. So in other words, the other ones, even if you gave them four requests at a time and they had a chance to kind of ramp up a little bit, they still don't hold a candle to this Optane part, just giving it one request at a time and how fast it can reply. Um, so the key there is it's extremely fast turnaround time, almost to the point where it's comical to try to compare these things in a chart. Um, and, and the next chart down... I'm showing a, a kind of a different translation of all that data that lets me show you, actually, if you wanted to show like a saturation, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going all the way out to QDEP 256 as you go from left to right on this chart here. Um, and you can tell how quickly the Optane part in blue ramps up and reaches its saturation versus all of those NAND parts that have to, I mean, the crossover on this chart is not until uh, a QDEP exceeding 64. Right, right, and and only and only that micron part was able to surpass the Optane part, um, you know the P forty eight hundred X SSD, um, and, and I mean you know you're pushing QDEP one twenty eight two fifty six. You're actually getting to the point where there's not a lot of enterprise software even that will scale that high, like the software will only have so many threads. You uh, you might actually run out of just threads in the system to, you know, push that far with, depending on what your you know what your workload is, right? Just some, some different software suites will only push Q depth so high. Right. Like they're only capable of pushing it so high. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just an amazing difference there. That is phenomenal. Um, be between those two parts. Um, and, uh, so the, the next page over is yet one more comical thing, which we're going to take a look at the quality of service, which for enterprise parts is important, right? You want to know how, how consistent, a device is it's it's all good and great that it goes very fast on average oh, we want to know does it go very fast for all of the requests that it sees right you don't want a few of them that go really slow every so often that would be very bad um so we look at that in percentiles right so for enterprise the typical jargon is like they call it like two nines three nines four nines and basically three nines equals 99.9 percent .9%. so the point is what's your 99.9 percent .9 slowest io how slow is it, right? Um, and uh, what you're looking for on the chart like this, in, in the way that we present it, we actually present it in a high-resolution fashion as opposed to just giving you a table with numbers so you can actually see where the curves take a, where the, the curves take a turn at various points. Um, ideally, on this chart, you want a vertical line. And what you're looking at is almost a bunch of vertical lines on that chart, right? Uh, there's, your, there's your quickest response there, bottom left, right at the 10 microsecond point. Um, this SSD was actually going faster than 10 microseconds um, for, for Q-depth 1 latencies on average. Um, but then if you go all the way up into the, you know, what's your least likely but still slowest request, still well higher than 100 microseconds for, for most of the, you know, the typical Q-depths that you're going to run at. Now, if you wanted to see, if you skip down two charts, we can overlay those other two NAND products that we were talking about on the same thing. There's the quality of service results for those. And you might notice that once those products get past the 99% point, they actually take an elbow and shift over to the right. And you actually get, you know, you'll have some requests. If you wanted to, your five nines requests actually are slower than one millisecond. Meanwhile, you have, you know, the, the five nines for this Optane part running 
uh, significantly faster than that, you know, in the order of, um, you know, say 50 or 60 microseconds, Ugh, right? You're comparing, so... you're comparing the worst case microseconds to the best case. If you, if you followed the worst part of, of the top of that chart for the blue lines and you went straight down, you're still nowhere near the average speed of the competing products, right? Alan, um, I, I mean, this is phenomenal. This is this it's is, ridiculous, it's right? Ridiculous. It's just it's, it's comically it's comically fast. And I I know um, I know that for my system, this really will not make a performance difference because my system is not ready. It, it it cannot saturate this. It can't use it to its fullest potential. I still want one though. I mean, it's if it's well, NVMe. Now, when you when you say your system, what do you mean? You're referring to just your desktop system? No, I, I mean, I, so I've got I've got a little cluster that lives in my data closet that uh, serves out all the uh, the images that run on my network. Um, right. That that does have a healthy workload, but it's nowhere near what this is going to require. But, the, but here's here's provide. here's what you have to understand. Even even if you weren't going for consistency. Right. If you didn't, if you weren't so worried about that, if every so often you had a request that took a little bit longer than another one, um, 10x improvement is still it's, a noticeable it's difference. Still, it's still a 10x improvement. It is still a 10x reduction in latency. So every time an individual piece of information must be fetched, it's a tenth of the time, and those add up. Right. Uh, Alan, and I mean, you know, it, we, it's it's beyond the point of diminishing returns when you can do an order of magnitude gain. We got to bottom something. line this for our audience, though. So they're gonna okay. they're gonna look to you and they're gonna say, okay, look, we we've read your article. Uh, of course, we went to PC Perspective to to find it. Yep. We we know how phenomenally fast this is. How this is an absolute change in what we expect out of storage and even out of system memory. Yep. But they're gonna say, well, when can I get one? And they're gonna say, well, who is this for? When will it be for me? What okay. what would be the the bottom line you can offer to the Twilight Riot? So this is for enterprise, but it is a device with Crosspoint in it. Okay, uh, I believe I'm pretty sure that Monday is the day that Intel Optane Memory. That's that is a name, not they're not talking about Crosspoint specifically. Intel Optane Memory uh, should start shipping on Monday uh, after this weekend, um, and that is a caching type device, which will offer either one or two of these Crosspoint dies inside of it on a little M.2. SSD. Now you have to have uh, like a Z270 or newer motherboard to support it properly, but the idea is you could take a system with a hard drive in it and put a caching layer of up to 32 gigabytes of memory going as fast as what I just showed you. It may not go as fast total, like sequential throughput, for example, because you only have a couple of these dies and they can only go so fast, right? So, but you can still get on the order of over a gigabyte per second of sequential speed <laughs> out of just two of these dies sitting on a little M.2 SSD that, by the way, I think only costs like 77 bucks. Now, 77 bucks for 32 gigabytes seems like a lot, but you lay that over a hard disk, right? And for the stuff that does fit in the cache, that system could potentially run even quicker than a system that had a good SATA SSD in it, for example. Um, because again, the latencies are so much quicker, right? Um, definitely, you know, an improvement thing. So that's so this this enterprise product opens the door to having things like this Optane memory uh, part that's supposed to be you know a system accelerator kind of thing that's going to be you know a thing very soon. Um, and also, Intel has uh, they announced and we're pretty confident that it's going to happen. Uh, in, introduce a uh, Intel Optane SSD for client. That's not the final name, I'm sure, uh, but there will be a final name. Um, and that will very likely be a client version, just a consumer version of this enterprise SSD that we were just talking about. Uh, and that's supposed to be towards the end of this year or probably early next year, one or the other. Um, hopefully it doesn't cost $1,500 for 375 gigabytes uh, by the time that drops. But again, Enterprise pricing on a thing is usually more expensive than your, you know, than your standard, uh, you know, client side thing. But this is going to be bleeding edge. Obviously, it will be like power user or heavy enthusiast level pricing, right? Um, but you know, you're you're talking about a storage device that can, uh, that again, like we mentioned earlier, you need some catching up on the kernel side, the driver side, the software side. Um, but if you had a, a thing like this that could access data that quickly, you're actually getting to the point where you can start moving away 
from loading a game level into RAM and running it from there. You're actually getting to the point where you could potentially stream level data directly off of this drive. <laughs> right? The game the game would need to be aware of it, but you could theoretically you could do things like get rid of level loads on games. Uh, you know, you just have to make the game a different way, right? You can't code it to be backwards compatible all the way with hard disk speed. Obviously, that would be a horrible gaming experience. But if you co if you were to make a hypothetical game that was designed with this particular kind of product in mind, uh, you could just play through the game front to back and never see a loading screen, which I think would be amazing, right? Alan Malventano, you have just made people all around the world hate their PCs. Thank you for that, by the way. Really, <laughs> really appreciate that. Uh, if you could please tell the Twite Right where they can find you. Of course, they, they see you often on Twitch, but uh, you, I mean, you write the most in-depth reviews and the most in-depth analysis of storage products I've ever read. You, you are my storage guru, my storage Bible. Can you let them know where they can find you? I am at PC Perspective, PCPER.com or at Malentano on Twitter. I don't use that as much as I would like to, but I'm pretty much spending most of my time testing stuff. So, And, and now that uh, IDF is no longer, uh, are you <laughs> still going to find a reason to come out to San Francisco? I'm going to try. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Hopefully I'll see you next time. Alan Malventano from PC Perspective, also from This Week in Computer Hardware here on the Twit TV network. We thank you for being part of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Thanks. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, in just a second, we're going to jump over to the blips. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank a sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, Twide is brought to you by Drobo. It's a family of safe, expandable, yet simple to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. You just visit drobostore.com to learn more and use the code TWIT10 to save 10% off select Drobos, including the brand spanking new Drobo 5 and 2. Drobo was started when its founders suffered a hard drive crash. We've all been through that. It's a, it's a horrible experience. Oh, he thought his RAID array had him covered, but his backup drive failed. So he sought to create a better redundant storage solution. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. They invented Beyond RAID, which lets you add capacity to a live storage array while mirroring existing data. This increases capacity and allows you to add a drive or replace a drive with a larger one without having to redo your entire array. Drobo has a battery-backed cache. This is important to prevent write failures or data corruption in the result of a, a, a the result of a power outage. They're simple to use. You can add or swap drives without the use of any tools, and easy-to-read status lights let you know when you're actually running out of space. Now, Drobo just introduced the Drobo 5N2, which is the next era of simplified network-attached storage for your connected home or small office. The 5N2 provides high performance with an upgradable processor and port bonding capability via two gigabit Ethernet ports. It also features SSD compatibility and an MSATA accelerator. It gives you a small slot where you can add an MSATA card, which will allow you to speed up accesses and protect writes, plus disaster recovery for additional peace of mind. The Drobo 5N2 also includes Drobo apps, which include apps like Drobo Pix for photo backup and Plex for media streaming, a cloud app for backup and data syncing, developer tools for programmers and for websites. There's also a full LAMP stack and Node.js along with WordPress for web developers. You can use C, Go, Perl, Python, Ruby. There's even a Git client for those who will like to check out the latest repository. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to visit the Drobo store at drobostore.com learn more and to check out their complete line of products. Drobo has recently lowered prices on almost their entire line and Twit listeners can save an extra 10% off the purchase price of select Drobo models, including the Drobo 5N2 at drobostore.com. That's drobostore.com by using the code TWIT10. Once again, that's drobostore.com and use the code TWIT10. And we thank Drobo for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Chebert, Lou, we just got bombarded with, uh, well, a whole lot of data about the next thing that I absolutely need in my laptop, even though I know I'm not going to use it just so I can have bragging rights. Wow, that says a lot of really bad things about me. But gentlemen, let's go ahead and jump into the blips. Now, Broadcom switches are getting sensitive to time. Yesterday, Broadcom announced the first switch series that fully implements all IEEE time-sensitive network standards. 
The Broadcom mm-hmm. 53570 Ethernet Switch family builds off their Strata XGS series while adding nine IEEE standards, including path control and reservation, time aware shaper, frame preemption, cyclic queuing and forwarding, timing and synchronization, stream reservation, time based ingress, <coughs> frame replication and elimination, and front hall network profiling. These standards are essential for any applications where multiple devices must have an ability to sync to far above average accurate timing. Broadcom sees the new series being popular for automotive, scientific, industrial, telecom, and pro AV applications, as well as a way to make the hyper-synced IoT more useful. If you had 20 million or 20 times 10 to the 30 IPv6 scripture addresses, you would will be willing to sell some of your IPv4 addresses as well. MIT, or Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is in the process of privately selling part of their 16 million valuable IPv4 vent addresses to the highest bidder. The proceeds from the sale will fund additional upgrades to its network, as well as funds for future research. Behind closed doors, one of the largest blocks of addresses will be going to the retailer services giant Amazon in the coming months. There's no word on the net dollar amount they're receiving for the sale. Since MIT acquired the addresses back during the inception of the internet, if nothing else, they definitely will have a return on their investment. So you want to run your old Macintosh 68K apps on OS 6 or OS 7? Well, the Internet Archive is reviving some ancient Mac OS apps from the days of monochrome displays on Fat Macs, Mac Classics, and others using the PCE PC emulator that's been ported to JavaScript. The Ars Technical article doesn't make any sort of mention on how they got around the Apple prohibition on running the Mac OS on something other than Apple hardware. But I would imagine it's not the OS, but rather an emulator that can run some of the two decades old software that up till now needed an equally ancient computer to run on. So here you go. If you want to run Dark Castle, Frogger, or others from the archive, well, here's your chance to show your kids what you used to have. <laughs> Frogger. Well, let's not talk about Frogger. Let's talk about Wi-Fi. Xerus, you may remember, made a big splash in the wireless world with a unique AP design that put an array of radios in a flying saucer enclosure, along with a specially designed set of antennas that divided the 360 degrees around the array into physical slices. It was a fantastically efficient use of RF spectrum, allowing large venues to deploy a wireless network that could cope with an impossible density of devices. Lately, though, the company has been beset by questionable management decisions and a loss of their best engineering talent to competitors. They were a little player that made a big splash, but then lost its opportunity to become a big player. Well, they might get another chance as part of Riverbed. Riverbed will be acquiring Xerus for an undisclosed sum and using their tech as part of its software-defined WAN strategy. Xerus arrays will be integrated into Riverbed's SteelConnect SD-WAN system, allowing for cloud-hosted virtual wireless networks with policy that will deploy from HQ down to the edge. Xerus is the latest in a string of high-profile wireless independents that have been snatched up by larger players looking for an edge in the network world. 2015 saw HP Enterprise acquiring Aruba Networks for $3 billion, around the same time that Meru Networks was acquired by Fortinet for $44 million. Just last year, Brocade purchased Ruckus Wireless for $1.2 billion, before selling it to Eris just seven months later for $800 million. So Intel's pretty busy lately. The Silicon Giant is up to it again and plans to move up its release on its latest and greatest platform, the Coffee Lake processors. If the name says anything, Intel is hoping that it offers additional pep from its previous generation processing, allow it to be compete full of uh, the Amazon the AMD's Ryzen 7 and 5 processors. The release of Coffee Lake is this August offering several K-series i3 and i5 variants. Starting at Copytex this year, Intel plans to unveil its Basin Falls platform with Skylake X and KV Lake processors as well. Intel Skylake X series features a 140 watt processor with 6 and 8 and 10 core architectures, while KB Lake uh, X series features a 112 watt quad core processor. Intel also plans to release a 12 core Skylake X processor in August as well. Coffee Lake chips are manufactured on Intel's 14 nanometer processor platform, and it will be the fourth processor family to use the architecture after Broadwell, Skylake, and KB Lake. Apple is actually rumored to have new machines in the works for 2010. In 2017, including the new iMacs, which are likely to use the KB Lake chips, chips as well. Jim, I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. The X Prize for a real life tricorder, tricorder goes to a self funded team. The quest is over for the most promising automated diagnostic gadget inspired by the fictional tricorder used by Dr. McCoy in Star Trek. 
A seven-member self-funded team took first place at the International Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize competition and a $2.6 million prize. The team's prototype, called Dexter, works with an iPad and is designed to walk a patient through self-diagnosing 34 medical conditions. The Washington Post reports the team beat out 312 other teams, including some backed financially by governments and corporate sponsors. The team was led by Dr. Basil Harris, an emergency medicine doctor from Pennsylvania who find, founded Final Frontier Medical Devices with friends and three of his siblings to come up with this device. They will now move their beta version on to the next stages of development and potentially FDA testing. Sadly, my own Scanadu, which we, we actually took a look at in the last episode of Before You Buy, which was also entered into the contest, is shutting down May 17th after failing to obtain FDA approval. Now, security analysts have spent the past few months unpacking a recent spat of network attacks and incidents that have shown that corporate espionage, influence peddling, advanced persistent threats, and data manipulation go hand in hand in hand in hand. Now, with more state actors realizing that vulnerable networks often translate into real economic and political power, there has been an industry-wide rethinking of security best practices, and it starts at the top. This past January, after the U.S. intelligence community gave him an assessment concluding that Russia had interfered in last year's elections, then-President-elect Trump made the pledge, quote, I will appoint a team to give me a plan within 90 days of taking office, unquote. We're now at the 91-day mark, and not only is there no plan, but there's no team and no talk of a process to create such a team. Rudy Giuliani was tasked with building private sector security partnerships, but the silence on the cyber has several enterprise gurus pushing for executive action. Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, was supposedly working on an initial cybersecurity plan, but his office seems to be unaware of any activity or any future plans. It would seem that this promise fell through the cracks, which, given that similar attacks have been taking place in France and Germany, is not encouraging. It doesn't help that the enterprise has been suspicious of the government that is ostensibly trying to protect it. Until we hear more, it's up to you, you enterprise rock stars, to trust no one. That does it for the blips. Next up, have you ever wondered what it takes to create a proper honeypot? Well, we've got F5 coming on to show you exactly what that means. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take another moment to thank another sponsor, of this week in enterprise tech. Now, this episode of Twiet is literally, literally brought to you by Sonic. That's Twit's 10 gig fiber internet service provider. The internet infrastructure in the United States needs fixing. We all know this. There are too many people paying far too much for unsatisfactory internet. Sonic delivers fast, affordable internet, phone, and TV to homes and businesses all over California. Sonic's mission is to bring internet freedom to all with unlimited and uncapped internet. They deliver residential and business fiber to the premise networks with gigabit connectivity in San Francisco, the North Bay, and the East Bay. Their internet service plans include 15 email accounts and one gigabyte of storage, personal web hosting with a new domain and fax service connection. They even include a home phone connection with unlimited local and long distance calling. And get this. It's only $40 a month. That's right. For $40 a month, Sonic offers download speeds of up to 1,000 megabits per second. Now, on a personal note, I have always been impressed by Sonic's long-standing commitment to support customer privacy. Their record shames other ISPs because they don't treat privacy as an option. They treat it as something that is in their DNA. It's baked into the company. By standing up for, for privacy, for friendly and local customer support, for uncapped bandwidth and affordable pricing for all products, Sonic's customer advocacy is paving the way for a better state of internet access in America. Folks, they tell you that you could vote with your dime. You could also vote with your internet connection. If you are in a Sonic area, if you don't like what's going on with your current provider, if you want faster, less expensive internet, you owe it to yourself to try Sonic. Join the internet revolution. Visit sonic.com slash twit and receive your first month of Sonic internet and phone service for free. Plus, bundle with Dish and save $120 off your Sonic bill. Just visit, visit sonic.com slash twit. That's sonic.com slash twit. And we thank Sonic for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. 
Joining us for my favorite part of the show where we bring in a guest to make sure that we can drop all the most recent enterprise knowledge on y'all is Mr. Ray Pompon. He is the Principal Threat Researcher Evangelist at F5 Labs. Ray, thank you very much for joining us on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Great. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, F5 shouldn't be one of these companies that we really have to introduce to our audience. You've been around forever. Mm -hmm. If they've ever been to a networking conference, the, let me let me do a little visual cue. Do you know the little red squeezy balls? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's F5. Oh, Ray, mm -hmm. F5 has, <laughs> it's right behind you. F5 has evolved over the years. Um, you know, when we first used F5 in the, uh, the interop uh, network, we were using you as a load balancer, but you've really grown to, to encompass more and more parts of the network package. C can you tell me what is your specific area of expertise? So I'm a security guy. I've been a security guy since actually the days I was back at UH and New Bryan. Um, so one of the things about F5 is we've always been doing security because we've been in front of all the web servers and, and enterprise apps. We've had our hands in securing things, if nothing with encryption and high availability. And so my um, job here is really to take a lot of that focus and a lot of that, that uh, expertise in security and provide that back out to the world. And that's what F5 Labs is about. We do security research and we, we publish uh, application threat intelligence. Now, this is, this is important because when you say you're a security researcher, when you say that you, you look for threat intelligence, you're not one of these people who just reads journals and looks at theoreticals. You've <laughs> actually participated in investigations. Yes, I have. Um, so I've been a security consultant. I actually have done undercover work with the FBI. I've built and managed uh, enterprise security systems in the financial sector gotten through audit and uh, here I'll just plug my book a little I wrote a book about how um, tech people can actually get into the security world and and learn all this stuff and, and get through audit so I've, I've got the the years of experience and then as well we do experiment and, and look at data we have honeypots we have darknet we have researchers and so I'm taking a lot of that data and producing things that are we call actionable intelligence which are reports, if you kind of think of like the things that, that the leaders get, the president gets of, here's a report, here's something that's going on that's bad on the internet, and we'll explain it and it's sort of an executive level, and here's what you need to do about it. Uh, and that's really my primary focus. Uh, I'm glad that you brought that up, actionable intelligence. We're going to get to that in a little bit when we start talking about F5 Labs. But I, I do want to bring up to our audience, because I, I know we've got a lot of folks who have written to us over the years, and they said, look, we, we want to get into security. We love this, this idea of playing in this, this new playground. But most of them, when they think of security, they think of encryption. They think of a lot of very complicated math <laughs> doing algorithms for, for encryption and decryption. But, you know, we also see there is a huge demand for people who can actually utilize the tools at their disposal to collect actionable intelligence. What does actionable intelligence mean? Well, I mean, it, it literally means that you get, you get information and you can apply it to your organization in such a way that you can make a decision. In the security world, that means what we say, adjust a control. So a control is like a password or an encryption or you know, some sort of security thing that we're using. A security policy can be a control. And so when you look at your actionable intelligence, it's like, oh, there's new phishing attacks that use this technique. So maybe we can adjust our security awareness training or we can adjust how we filter email. And so the security lead can actually make a decision and, and use that to make their security better. And then part of being a security professional is being plugged into that world and being able to see things as things are changing to be able to keep evolving your security system. Right, right. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about FI Labs because, of course, you're representing the F5 uh, here. <laughs> FI Labs has, uh, well, you've been doing some interesting work with honeypots. What, what is F5 Labs? So it's really our threat intelligence division. So we are somewhat segregated away from the regular F5 world of, you know, devices and, and security appliances and managed services. So we exist primarily to provide threat research. So we're collecting data that's being created by F5 researchers all over. And yes, some of our F5 
teams actually run honeypots. They're collecting actual attacks because they're using that to make our products better to block active attacks on our managed services. Well, I'm now taking that information as well and my team, and we're creating reports that we publish to uh, you know, other people can actually use that to, to help them. And that's my primary focus. And uh, I'd say honeypots are just one minor part of many of the different ways that we're collecting intelligence. Right. right. Of course, honeypots are quite possibly the sexiest because we, they've been around for a long time. And everybody, everyone I know in IT has run at least one honeypot, maybe just as an experiment to see what happens. I, I remember at, <laughs> yeah. at Interop... We used to do this this fun thing. I would bring a couple of boxes. This was before virtualization really became popular. Disposable boxes. And we would hook them up to a real IP address to see how quickly they got owned. Then we would take them down and analyze them to find out what they got owned with. I would figure that F5 probably has a bit more sophisticated honey ha honeypot techniques. Can you tell us what a typical F5 honeypot looks like? Um, we don't really have a typical F5 honeypot. A honeypot technology, is, I mean, part of the, the fun of it is you're not going to tell everybody this is what our honeypots look like. Right. Uh, <laughs> there is um, there's a wide variety of honeypots, and I think what people think of them is they're not as simple as, oh, here's a fake machine that you log into. They can be fake services. They can be fake data. They, they call it honey data. Um, one of the interesting things is actually using honey clients. So these are headless or fake client browsers that go out and surf the web and then collect malware as if they're a machine. And then you can actually analyze the malware and use that to create signatures and to create new rules. So there's a lot of interesting areas. And, you know, it kind of goes into the how do we collect intelligence? How do we collect what the bad guys are doing? Um, going on to social networks and going into dark nets and, and looking and, and, you know, observing those conversations and things like that. So, you know, it's a a broad spectrum of, of different techniques to collect information. Speaking of the broad spectrum of different techniques, uh, the, you do have an entry in your book talking about deceptive defense patterns or de deceptive defense solutions. Uh, yes. What, what does that, is, does that just mean trying to lead an attacker away from the actual data? Um, that's part of it. That's part of it. Some of it is, is as we were just describing to, um, lead the attacker to a place where you can actually study them and see what their techniques are and, and use it for threat intelligence. And sometimes it's, we want them to attack this thing over here instead of the real database so that while they're attacking our fake thing, alarms are going off and we can actually isolate them on the network. And if you want to get really advanced, you can start to create um, more virtual services and things so that you're actually, they're following this long fake trail while you're observing them from the outside, you know, you use out of band communication and you can start altering their experience and start tracking them down and, and calling in law enforcement. So, uh, you know, a deception can be as, as complex as that, or it can be as simple as putting in fake data for them to steal and then watching where that fake data shows up on a dark net. And you can kind of, it's kind of like a leak test when you put uh, dye in a, in a big balloon and see where the, where the ink is coming out. One of my favorite uh, deceptive defense uh, stories that I heard about was there's a firm in D.C. that they had actually set up, uh, it, it looked like a very well-defended system, but it had several very common exploits that you could use to get in and do remote code execution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then they had, they had hash files. And of course, everyone's going to go for a hash file. If you see something that looks like hash files, you're going to pull right. it down. But if you decoded it, you thought you got access to a few Yahoo and, and Google accounts, but those were deceptive. If you logged into them, that was just so that they could log what IP you were coming from, look at exactly. your client, et cetera. Uh, and uh, I, I love stories like that because someone who has, may, maybe maybe is using a script kitty package in order to, to get that and then to decrypt using something like Hashcat, they don't realize that they have just exposed information about themselves. And, and that's that plays back into that old cat and mouse game that so many of us thought security was going to be about, even though we've got Emily in the Strange saying she works in security and it's mostly about paperwork. Yes. <laughs> well, and then the, the paperwork comment is actually the big thing of why deceptive techniques really haven't caught on. So I've worked in enterprise right. security for decades and nobody, no auditor really cares about your honeypots. Auditors, they have a list and you know they want to make sure that you've checked off everything on the list. 
And, oh, honeypots, sure, that's extra. You know, deceptive technology, that's extra. But have you done your list? And until deceptive technology actually shows up on somebody's list, you really don't get credit for it. And so it's extra credit. So it may be something that's great for you. It gives you threat intelligence. It helps defend your network. But you have a limited budget. You have limited time. So you're going to work the list that the people are going to audit you to. And maybe, you know, if you get around to it, you could do some of the extra stuff. Wow. Okay. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, that's very disappointing. Uh, it's absolutely true. The fact that an IT person, one who's in charge of security, will hit the checklist. That's just, that's job security. You, you will get fired right. if you don't hit the checklist, even right. though those other practices tend to do more. I mean, they, they provide yes. you more security than just making sure your firewall is up to date and you've got policy that's enabled and et cetera, et cetera. So is that something that you can teach? Is that something that FI can help clients with? Or that that's just part of the game? You you have to make sure that you don't get fired before you can actually do the things that might work better. That's kind of what my, my advice is usually. Make sure you have a well-balanced breakfast and you know do the things you need to do and then look at this. Look at what you can add. I think another problem that you have in, in, in a lot of organizations, um, security and IT are, are sometimes separate departments. So security will throw up honeypots and deceptive techniques, and the IT group will stumble on them and get confused. And then you have sort of some internal friction there, and, and that's another kind of stumbling block to getting this done. So I say I've, I've been speaking about deceptive technology uh, and, and security for years. I did a big presentation at Tour Camp in 2009, and at the time it seemed like deception techniques and honeypots were going to take off. And nothing really happened. And then when I was at RSA this year, I saw a number of companies advertising honeypot and, and deceptive solutions. And I was like, maybe this will be the year it'll takes off. But until you really see it migrate to a checklist or somebody to champion it, maybe the president when he finally does come out with his plan, um, it's it's really going to be hard to get there. All right. Well, well, then how how do we get there? And how do you convince someone that a honeypot is a good thing to run? It, I think it's an, an important part of doing threat intelligence. So there's a lot of material on our F5 Labs website about how to do threat intelligence. We have a big report there about what is threat intelligence because that's a whole other topic and it confuses people because some people think it's a data feed and some people think it's just you know checking a box on your firewall to download data. And we say it's something more. And, and in a true threat intelligence program, is something you build within your enterprise, within your security team. And an important part of building threat intelligence is you want to be able to gather information about attackers. And you would do that with honeypots. That's, that would be one of the techniques. So that's that's sort of where we give our advice in that area. All right. Uh, anyone who's gone to Black Hat or DEF CON, after a, a few visits, you realize <laughs> that 90% you know, of the attacks are going to be... I, and we call them script kiddies, but it's really people who, who might be in their journey of security researchers. They're probably going to start with some sort of security tool set that can run uh, several attacks, some of which are incredibly effective. Uh, and, and then you have the elite people. You have the elite people who teach right. the rest of us, and they, they're the ones who actually come up with the exploits. What does your honeypot tell you about those two different groups of people? Is it is it easy to tell when someone is being a script kiddie and when someone is actually actively probing for new exploits? That's a really good question. Um, in my experience and in, in my career, I've always geared my honeypots towards the second because you know, I've built honeypots that collected the script kitties and the, mal you know, the worms that are out there just probing across the internet, collecting whatever garbage they can to, to resell. And your honeypots just immediately fill up with data. And it's like, hey, look, this entire country is attacking us. Well, Surprise, surprise. We knew that. And then, you know, that gets back to like, you do your well-balanced breakfast, you build your strong perimeter, um, you build, you know, your, your strong authentication. And then deeper within your network is where maybe you'll put your, your deceptive technologies, your honeypots. And so while you're scraping off 90% of the, of those script kitties, you're getting that, you know, the people who actually do make it through all those defenses trip over that little fake thing you set up there that sends an alarm that tells you, Hey, maybe there is an APT on my network that I didn't know about, right. and you know maybe that alarm only goes off once every you know six months or something that you've got something probing around or something that's pivoting sideways. That's very useful information to have. If I had that out on my perimeter where the script kitties were, it would be going off pretty much twenty four seven. 
And, and that's not useful. We already have enough of that just coming out of our firewall and intrusion detection logs. We really want to know what, you know, what we're actually going to get hurt. Right. Oh, that, actually, that's, that's an interesting point. So how many of your honeypots are turned inwards and how many are turned outwards? Be, because, I, I mean, the ones on the outside are going to be constantly getting probed by automated tools. But it's the ones on the inside that become scary. Because if there's something on the inside of the network that's doing something it shouldn't be doing, that's when you, as you mentioned, that's when you start thinking you have an APT. Right. Exactly. And I really can't speak much about F5 because F5 Labs is really external facing. So we're providing intelligence out to the rest of the universe. But I have run those kind of things in an enterprise environment. And the interesting things that we've tripped over, and it has been like once every you know couple of years, have been a sysadmin who's maybe exceeded their authority and started playing around with some hacking tools or maybe played around with something and got infected. And now you've got a bad thing that's that's got admin credentials running around on your network and it trips over the honeypot or you've got somebody who's just playing around going hey i want to see what i can see and that may or may not be a violation of your security policy but you know you don't want users running nmap across your internal network and boom you know it, it fires off an alarm and you're like well i never expected to see an alarm on that and then you you know maybe somebody's going to get some discipline or or have their job retasked so you know, yes, you do put them deep in your network, and you do. I, I have been on action from results of that. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go off on a tangent just a, a little bit here because one of my other shows, uh, Know How, uh, we did a Network 101 series, and one of the things I, I taught them to do was to use Nmap to see if their their network was secure inside <laughs> and outside. But I I specifically <laughs> told them I said, look. This is a security tool. Only run it against a network you control. Only run it against your IP because this is something that tools will detect automatically. And we said it three times over the course of three episodes. <laughs> and then I got three emails from people who were like, oh, Father Ballister, I ran it at work and they hated me. I'm like, well, I told you not to do that. <laughs> like yeah. I, was, I was just checking to see if my network was secure. Like, oh, my goodness. But uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've run to cubicles to go deal with people who've done those by accident. And we usually let them off the hook. Right. But yes. It's like, well, I found this new tool. And on YouTube, they explained to me how to work it. Like, well, okay, do it at home. Now, I, I do want to hear, if you're willing to talk, a little bit about Operation Flyhook. We, we're going to go to our hosts, our, our co hosts, and just a bit and open up the discussion. But is there mm -hmm. anything you can tell me about this? Because this was sort of teased to me before the show. Ah, well, um, so this actually happened a long time ago, um, back in 2000. Um, there's actually a whole book on it called The Lure, it was written by one of the prosecutors. And it was um, this was back when uh, Russian hackers were actually just smashing through organizations and stealing data. And, and one of the things that we discover in, in threat research is it's very hard to monetize hacking. They've gotten a lot better with it now, obviously, with ransomware and things like that. But back in back in those days, they would actually they would do a variant of actually of, of ransomware. They would take data and then threaten organizations that um, if they didn't pay, they would delete all their data or they would release their data. And then one of those organizations decided to call the FBI and basically said, hey, these guys are coming in. And they would, they would disguise their, their actions under, hey, we're security researchers and we broke into your network and we found all this data. And if you don't pay us as consultants, we're going we're gonna to trash everything. And so they basically they, – they, that organization called the FBI. The FBI said, hey, they want to be security consultants? Let's give them a job interview. And I, at the time, was actually working with the FBI as a security consultant. And they said, hey, we've got these Russian hackers coming for a job interview uh, to Seattle. And so we're going to build an undercover the, um, office. And we want you to be part of the team that, that interviews them. And I was like, oh, I get to play an evil security consultant. That was pretty cool. And, and it, it wasn't as Mission Impossible as you think. I mean, some of the, the fake cameras were like, really? That's the fake camera? You know, the lamp is the microphone? Okay. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I did get captured in sort of abscam video. If everybody remember what abscam looked like, it was like kind of this weird black and white. And uh, these guys pretty much confessed, you know, because they were bragging. And that was part of my job was to get them to brag about all their hacking they had done. And then they were arrested. And, um, it, and they turned out to be quite very technical hackers. One of the, the analysts on the case who was um, – commented that they were some of the best Windows integrators they'd ever seen. Of course, they were integrating malware into Windows <laughs> using zero days, but they were phenomenal. And they were doing some business-level hacking that we'd never seen before with this 
it, it, this is what I'm going to take four hours to talk about this because I, but the the book The Lure kind of gets into some of that. But they were doing some interesting money laundering involving eBay and Pearl robots and PayPal and um, trucks driving over over the border with stolen goods back into Russia to be resold wow. on the black market. It was bizarre. I, it was I, it was phenomenal. I've been on Amazon looking for The Lure and it just keeps giving me fishing items. Uh, but uh, uh, is there something uh, else I can search for to? To help me find uh, it, I'm very interested in that. The Stephen Schroeder is the author. He was actually the, the prosecuting attorney on the case, and it was like the lure, like the Russian hacker case or something like that. Okay, I I, I will definitely find it. We'll make sure it ends up in the sh in the show notes. That's uh that's probably one of my favorite. Oh, there we go. That's Thank it. you. Thank you. For wow, Kara, you're good. Oh, I. You know what? We need an we need an audio book of this so I can listen to it on my way to the next DefCon. <laughs> <laughs> be good if, it, if the audio narration had a Russian accent. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. In just a second, we're going to bring our co-host back in here. But first, let's go ahead and take one more break to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, this episode of Twyet is brought to you by GoCD. It's the on-premise open source continuous delivery server created by ThoughtWorks. That is the fastest way to model complex workflows across multiple teams with ease. GoCD understands the difficulty of deployment in a 24-7 environment that demands the five nines of uptime even as real-time deployment is expected. That's why they've built their delivery server to give you comprehensive pipeline modeling, easily configured dependencies for fast feedback, and on-demand deployment with parallel and sequential execution. Of course, if you've worked in development, you know that it's not just about what your tool does, but what it doesn't do. Specifically, GoCD avoids spurious builds by giving you fan-in, fan-out dependency management. That means you're never wasting your time with a build you don't actually need. Their value stream map lets you track a change from commit to deploy at a glance. And their real power is in the visibility that it provides you over your end-to-end -end workflow. You get complete control of and visibility into your deployments across the organization. They also offer complete customization for your software's individual needs. GoCD will perform tests written in most languages or frameworks, and their test reporting is phenomenal. It's so thorough that it won't just tell you that your build failed the test. I mean, we know that. It's not working. It will actually tell you exactly in which chain set and on what platform a test started breaking. It's that kind of granularity that gives you the actionable intelligence you need to fix your deployment. Now, you can also compare content across any two arbitrary builds, making it invaluable when troubleshooting a broken pipeline, and it's flexible. It supports audible deployment. It lets you delegate the configuration of pipelines to users without full-blown admin privileges. And it has extension points that let you connect to any of a number of ready plugins or lets you write plugins yourself. The TLDR is you can say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent predictable deliveries. GoCD is an open source package that you can download and use for free. Discover the power of their pipelines at gocd.io slash twit. That's gocd.io slash twit. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are also available. And we thank GoCD for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Gentlemen, I want to go ahead and bring you back into the discussion here. Chibert, let's, let's, let's back up a little bit because I know you've run honeypots. I've seen the honeypots running in your data center. But honeypots, as as was mentioned, seems to be an extra, and it's not just an extra. It's it's actually a negative in the eyes of some auditors because they they think you're increasing the attack surface. Yeah, the um, I've actually ran into a few managers that think they knew better, and shall we say it was someone almost lost their job. Because uh, they said, well, if you've got enough time to go and create a honeypot and attract additional attention to our network, you must not be doing your regular job. And so the, the, the kid that thought he was doing the corporation a good thing, um, shall we say he got passed over enough that he said, I'm gone. It's it's sad. You know, the, there's a lot of folks out there. There's a lot of wannabes. Let's put it that way. And this is a time when there are script kiddies. There's wannabe security experts and so forth. What I usually tell a lot of people is, you know, just 
let's talk to the people that actually do this type of thing. Actually, the you know, rubber, where the rubber meets the road. Let's go and talk to them at places like InfraGuard. In fact, I'm going to throw this to Ray. Say, hey, what do you feel? You know, is InfraGuard one of those organizations that's gathering the real folks together? Is it worth joining? Ray, come on. Well, it, you know, I, I'm the founding president of the Seattle chapter of InfraGuard, so uh, <laughs> um, yes, I, it, the chapters vary, but there's definitely a high quality of the of people involved. Um, sometimes you do get a lot of wannabes. There is a vetting process to join InfraGuard. I mean, you have to go through a background check. You have to be vouched. So you're you're usually not just getting the you know the complete wannabe. Though there is a wide variety of expertise and a lot of you know. And, in regard, you get physical security folks as well, which actually is very interesting. And I could go off on a, several hours about that. How you, once you want to get a mixture of security professionals talking about their various ideas, but I actually have run honeypots and presented the results at InfraGuard meetings, and it was quite interesting, especially when you have um, FBI agents in the room going, "Hmm, that's that's an interesting thing you found there." Um, I I wouldn't I'm not going to be able to comment whether the FBI has run honeypots and that kind of thing but uh you can guess um but infraguard is actually a, it's, it's a trusted organization so there is that uh that confidentiality to, to really talk about some things going on within your organization and know that they're not going to be made public and and that kind of gives you an additional level of reassurance at, around the what you're hearing now I let's bring Lou into this discussion. Lou, you've um, you've had a little of experience with uh, with red and blue uh, adversary conflict teams. Uh, what what does that tell you a little bit about what F5 is trying to do with honeypots and with uh, de defend, deceptive defensive practices? Yeah, I mean any big service nowadays, they're always looking for ways to you know define what their security surface. I mean what their surfaces, what their attack surface is. And so, for instance, a lot of these. Uh, big companies they have with their red, blue, and purple teams that come in and um, either the red teams being external and blue being internal, and they find a way to go in and, and try to attack the different surfaces of the system. And sometimes in order for them to kind of understand where the weak points are, they need to see what the their adversaries, you know, outside the, uh, in the outside world, um, actually use what kind of tactics they use. And so, and big services like AWS and, and Azure and you know, even Amazon sites like that are always being attacked. Um, and so in order for them to kind of understand the different trends, um, and just get a better view of things, maybe things they don't know about that people with different tactics, people are doing, you know, what, you know, what are people doing to, to, uh, break security and, and these types of different tactics, they need honeypots and they do use honeypot techniques uh, in order to do that and to gain additional skills that they don't always have. Um, you know, penetration testing is big, is big in this world. And in order for you to kind of stay on top of things, sometimes you need to know what your adversaries are doing. So I, I, I think it's definitely a, a great tactic to continue using. Um, but like Brian says, you know, sometimes security by obscurity, meaning just kind of living under the wire is a little bit better, especially from an audit, auditing perspective. But when you're a huge service, cloud service, it's almost impossible to do that. And so using these techniques to gain more insights is always a better technique. Yeah. And Ray, speaking of those insights and the, the, the intelligence that you gather, what's the typical route of publication? So once you are able to determine that there's a new exploit, a new attack, or maybe a new player on the field, how, how does that disseminate to your clients, to the customers, to, to the public? Uh, right now, we're actually publishing a lot of that research directly on the F5 Labs website. So, you know, it's all free. You just go up there and read it. There is a sort of a back end where we're actually using that intelligence to improve our products and improve our services. And so what I'm doing, uh, what, what my team is doing, is, is we're trying to take that and maybe genericize it a little bit more so that when people go to F5 Labs, they can read that material and say, okay, how does this apply to me? How can I make use of this in my organization? Um, so really, you know, we're, we're trying to do our best to get the stuff out there as fast as we can in a way that doesn't compromise our sources. Right, right. And if, if someone wanted to start getting into this, they just actually wanted to see what kind of intelligence they can interpret, what what are the things they should be looking at? What what are the, the pieces that would stand out the most for a security researcher going over one of those F5 lab reports? So we actually have a whole report on that, on, on application threat intelligence. It's sort of 
walks through somebody who's getting who wants an introduction to the subject that talks about what is threat intelligence. And in there, we actually point out like, you know, here's some sites, here's some things that you can look at to, to learn this stuff. I mean, you know, there's the threat intelligence in the sense of a, of a data feed and looking at what sticks and taxi is doing, which is the formats for those data feeds. And there is, um, there are a lot of InfraGuard and those kind of places at Homeland Security. They actually publish threat intelligence reports as well. Um, I just uh, last month gave a couple of webinars where I was going through some of those and talking about like, look at these reports. I mean, you see these things out there, but if you actually read through it, you can actually get some interesting ideas about how you can defend your network. Um, I, I think, you know, I think there's a big need out there because there's a lot of, of IT folks and, and IT security folks are, who need to kind of come up to speed on a lot of these techniques and, and defend themselves better. And, you know, there's not a lot of, it, of good information out there. Oh, Ray, I I want to keep talking. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> and I know you've got some great stories that you, you can bring to us. But unfortunately, we've gone way, way, way <laughs> over our allotted time. And I'm going to have to call it. Uh, I've asked Chibert, and thank you for the uh, the chat room telling us to do this. I've asked him to mark you down. We, we want to have you back at some point in the near future. Maybe we can get you on with Rafael Mudge and we could just go nostalgic <laughs> about red-blue attacks. W would you be willing to come back onto This Week in oh. Enterprise Tech? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, fantastic. And if you could please tell tell our audience where they can find you, where they can find F5, where they can find F5 Labs, where they can read some of the actionable intelligence that you've gathered over the years. F5labs.com, and everything you need will be there. There you go. Actually, that's the main F5 site, but if you drop down the lab site, um, which is actually a subset of the main site, You'll see a lot of our material. No, oh, we'll find it. Again, that's Ray Pompani. He is the principal threat researcher and evangelist at F5 Labs. Uh, this man uh, has worked with the FBI and uh, with Chebert, which is kind of strange. I don't I know how to make that connection now. Ray, thank you again very much. Uh, you know what? I, I, I've, I've enjoyed this so much. Is there Are there any last words you want to give to the audience? Um, I'll plug my book again. Yes, please, please <laughs> do that. So th this was written for IT professionals moving into the security world. Um, I did not come up with the title. It was sort of SEOized, but um, it's it's sort of your soup to nuts of all, you know, you need to have a little bit of technical expertise, but you can kind of, you gain a lot of about how security works, how risk analysis works in, in, in very much detail, how to actually implement a control. It's one thing to say, I'm going to write a security policy. How are you going to get people to actually follow it? And, and I go into a lot of that detail. It's It's very... It's 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 not too. It doesn't look very thick, but I think it's, it's there's a lot of density to it. Ray, thank you again, and we will have you back on this week at Enterprise Tech. Great, thank you, well, folks. You've done it again. You you've used up another hour listening to the best dang podcast, Enterprise Podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten honeypots. I want to thank everyone who makes this possible. Of course, to Ray. He dropped some incredible knowledge on us, on Alan Malventano as well, and to my co-host, one of whom has a heart out, and he's kind of sweating it right now, Mr. Lou Maresca. Before you have to depart, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you? Oh, you're muted. Actually, I'm sweating because there's uh, 25 machines in my office, but oh, uh, you can always find me on twitter.com slash louamm, and uh, check out all my work at uh, crm.dynamics.com. Fantastic, Lou. Thank you very much, and uh, get to that call. And, of course, to my friend, Mr. Brian Chi of the Dire of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. By the way, folks, he's also our producer. That's right. He became the producer over a year ago. So if you like our guests, this is the man who gets them, so you got to give him some props. Chibert, where can they find you? My Twitter handle is at A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B. You know, I've been watching the uh, chat room. You know what would be really cool? I still quite haven't figured it out because we need more channels to do this. I want to do a baby cyber range on the show and do a live red team versus blue team on the show. What do you think, man? Only if I can be the black and white team. Well, you know, white team are the judges. Oh, okay. Black there team go. is infrastructure. There, there you go. go. I'll do both of them. Fantastic. Actually, I'm, I'm, I would be down for that. I'd, I'd love to have Ray and... Raphael, go at it. Actually, you wouldn't want to have them go head to head because that's no fun. You actually just want to see their critique. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. But, you know, red team attacks, blue team defends. 
So and oh. green team gets coffee. I don't know. I'm yeah. not sure how that works. <laughs> Chibert, work on it. Get us a schedule. I am down for that any way you go. Uh, but again, is there is there a place that we can find your work? Oh um, yeah, I'm actually get um publishing more uh, at infoworld.com, so that's going to be fun and uh, obviously catch me on Twitter TV Scott um Twitter hit me with show ideas love them and to cursed let's go figure out how to go and get some faster internet to your dad's house in uh, the big island fantastic gentlemen thank you one and thank you all and of course Thanks to you, to the person who watches and listens each and every single week. Without you, we don't have an audience. Without an audience, we don't have Twiet. We want to make it easier for you to get the episodes that you long for. So you can go to our show notes at twit.tv slash twiet. That's T-W-I-E-T. There you'll find all of our episodes as well as the drop downs for our show notes, the links to the stories that we've talked about, as well as two links specifically to subscribe to the version of your choice that gets delivered automatically into the device of your choice. It is the best way to support Twite. It's also the best way to share all the enterprise goodness with your friends and loved ones. Because, hey, you know what? Your loved ones need to know how their world is connected. I also want to thank everyone here who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lisa and Leo, who have allowed us to continue doing Twite all these years. To all of the staff, the engineers, to to Alex and uh, those folks who make sure that, that the bits are running properly. And to our substitute TD today who did an absolute fantastic job. Kara Cole, Kara, could you tell the folks what it is that you do here at Twit? Uh, well, I've been sitting in this chair since 11. I got to sub for Victor and Kevin today, which is always fun. Love doing these shows. Uh, I produce screensavers on Saturday, and I also TD that show, and I'm just all over behind the scenes. And, of course, it's the time when I always ask my TD a question. Uh, Kevin has never gotten one of these rights in over a year. So, uh, Kara, uh -huh. your question is, what episode number is today's episode? 236. Wow, you know, <laughs> took me forever. my goodness, you you got it right off the bat. I mean, yeah. Kevin's never gotten an answer right, so go figure. Uh, we may have to make some you, moves you, there. You give him softballs. Indeed. Also. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballisare, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Yeah.